uh, loud. Uh, I'm just sad that Andreas is not here because he bullied me the whole evening yesterday, telling me I should be clever and clear and develop my ideas, but he's not here, so I'm not so sure that I will be clever just because he's not here. But I'll make an effort. Also, in the direction that Carlos suggested in the first day, you should try to make big mistakes, so you'll be able to tell whether that's what I have done in the end or not. Uh, so what I'm going to present is a discussion about, about political regimes, and in particular, I'll try to articulate uh, the idea of advanced liberal oligarchy, which is an, uh, the core of an article I had written, uh, and part of something bigger I have been writing. And but, I mean, we could speak also. There are, there are several regimes in, in the world today, but roughly speaking, we could divide that between those that have something to do with liberal democracy, at least ideally conceived, and the tradition of real socialism, which is still very important in the world. You just take China, Vietnam, Cuba, to some extent, Angola and Mozambique, you still have some sort of, yes, Angola and Mozambique less, but still there is something there, right? But uh, you have a lot of countries with a different sort of political regime, which is supposed to have something to do with uh, democratic centralism. And they will operate in a different way from the liberal systems. Uh, which are more individualistic. You don't have this verticalization which is collectively organized from below and should be going up with a responsiveness from the top to the demands and the ideas that you find in the basis, the sort of this dialect. That at least that's how the system presents itself. But I'm not discussing this here. I'm just discussing the other parts uh, of contemporary political systems which us, in a way or another, uh, or pretend to be, in a way or another, liberal democracies. Right? Some years ago, you had a lot of dictatorships all over the world. And they would pretend to be regimes that were trying to reorganize their countries to, to, to return them back to liberal democracy or to, uh, to help create liberal democracy. But this is no, that's no longer the case. And of course, you have also small kingdoms, which are much more so supposedly traditional, you just look at Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, you have some variation, but I'm going to speak about uh, the liberal part of political systems we find in the world. I organize a, 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 a typology because there was uh, a typology that tried to innovate a bit on the discussion of regimes. This was a, an extremely important topic some years ago. A lot of people wrote about that. There are some people that still write about that, like Molino, Diamond, uh, and they're always criticizing the rest of the world for democratic shortcomings. But they never, ever speak of the US and Europe and the shortcomings of democracy in these countries. The problem is always elsewhere. Electoral, authoritarianism, uh, they have a lot of many names for this sort of thing. None of them apparently apply to the US. They only speak about, Levitsky has been giving a lot of interviews, for instance, uh, speak about the risks to democracy, even in the US and Latin America, but the risks would be populist, not intrinsic developments of liberal democracy, which is an easy way out of the problem but one which I find uh, actually insufficient, but not only insufficient, it's to some extent is really a mystification because it, uh, it hides the real problems of democracy in these countries. Uh, so within this typology, I won't go into detail about that. I have tried to work, especially uh, three types of liberal regime. Uh, traditional oligarchies, which were liberal regimes, 
restricted franchise, uh, a limited public sphere, or, or at least a, a, a different layers of public sphere in which the public, or popular public sphere was, was less important at least for the workings of the, uh, the formal political system. And there was, after many, many struggles, it was not granted from above. The idea that rights are granted from above, that you find in some writers, I find really mistaken. Rights has always been a, a conquest of people from below, of popular mobilization, and including political rights. And the expansion of the franchise, eventually, especially after the Second World War, where you don't really have many liberal democratic countries before uh, the end of the Second World War, World War. But after the war, there was a democratic imperative that was established and led to the development of liberal democracy, especially in Europe, in the US, and to some extent in Latin America, although we know that the, the, the process of getting to liberal democracy in Latin America was much more complicated. Eventually, <coughs> the so-called third wave of, of democratization, to use the Antintonian expression, reached the whole world, but uh, then these people who speak about regimes are keen to identify limitations to this transition, hybrid regimes which would be not really democratic, and they equate, of course, democracy to liberal democracy, and therefore, Africa, parts of Asia, would have become more or less liberal democratic as well. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not disputing this claim. It's true that liberal democracy has become a, a, a widespread regime across the world. My point is basically that we are witnessing now, probably, the, the birth of a different sort of regime which is no longer liberal democracy. Uh, and that's why I think there is a, a problem in the identification these people make of, of, of problems only outside the West. Uh, because uh, there is a re-oligarchization of liberal democracy that is faster paced and has meant a de-democratization of liberal democracy. Charlie Sinn has a discussion about uh, democratization and de-democratization. I think it's an interesting term. When you discuss regimes, it's important to have, of course, uh, an understanding of, of how they work. I have tried to develop what I think they are not ideal types, but they are models of analytically built uh, with some elements, imaginary, institutional. But it's also important to think of the dynamics of development of these regimes, how they turn into each other. They may move forward and backwards. And we witness it in, by the end of the Second World War, but before that as well to some extent, the development of liberal democracy, a de-democratization of liberal oligarchies, and now we are identifying, uh, we are undergoing a process which is a transition from this liberal democratic regime to advanced liberal oligarchy, which is a process of de-democratization. And I think this is a very serious problem. Also in Latin America, but I think this is clearly, uh, clearly in, the, in the US and in Europe. In slightly different ways, but still I think it applies to, to these areas, both of them. And it's, I think it's, it's going to take over the world. We have a lot of, of elements in Latin America that point to this as well. Uh, although I think uh, the oligarch system here is more conflicted than it is in Europe and the US, at least by now. It's not very clear how these things will develop in the next political cycle, but I'll speak a bit about that soon. Uh, that said, I'm not saying that there aren't oligarchical elements in liberal democracy. Liberal democracy has very strong oligarchical elements. Uh, that's very clear uh, when we look at the political system uh, and the whole structure is based on 
You can speak uh, about aristocratic dynamics. The representation as such is, implies some element of oligarchy. If you want to look at it nicely, you can speak about uh, an aristocratic element. That's more or less what Manin does in his discussion of, 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 of modern political system. But you can look at that from a more negative way. And you can think of that in terms of oligarchical tendencies which are really deep ingrained in liberal democracy. Uh, because there is a, a very clear separation between those who control the formal political system and those who are on the other side of the political system. We should speak about uh, a state-based political system on the one hand and a societal-based political system on the other. And you have mediators between these two sides of the political system. Usually, those who control the levels of power are in the formal political system. And, of course, they also mediate with the societal political system. But they are capable of holding uh, uh, not only the levels of power, but they are gatekeepers in relation to what happens between the societal political system and the state political system. And they can control oligarchically, filter to some extent, what uh, goes through from the societal political system to the state political system. And this has meant in, in the life of liberal democracy very oligarchical elements, which have to do with the structure of political parties, has to do with the structure of electoral politics has to do also with other things that are more in the side of the societal political system but are closely connected to the state political system unions for instance but also the media so you have when you speak about liberal democracy you don't have really direct expression of the demos of plebeians any sort of thing in the state political system there is a clear distinction between that my thesis is that we undergoing now a process in which this state political system has been even more closed in relation to society. I was talking to Andreas yesterday because I have presented this paper elsewhere with him on Wednesday. And he was insisting about uh, which institutions are fundamental for, for this advanced liberal oligarchy. And I was thinking about that yesterday, especially before I, I was able to sleep. I was trying to make sense of that because I've been thinking about this and the fact is I don't think there are so many differences in the institutions of liberal democracy and what I'm calling advanced liberal oligarchy. I think the institutions as such, even the imaginary, are very similar. Nothing has changed so much in this regard. What has happened is that I think liberal democracy has closed itself and has severed more, more or less deeply the relation between the formal state political system and the societal political system. I think that's uh, it's mainly a, not only in terms of formal rules, because in this regard there are changes as well, but especially in terms of the dynamic of mediation between the societal political system and the state political system that things have changed. This can take different forms. For instance, O'Donnell used to speak about delegative democracy. This can be one aspect of this closure of the formal political system. You can vote, right? In Africa, you know well about that. Voting doesn't mean that you really have democracy. You can vote, but it's more a legitimatory mechanism. Because you have one candidate and you have a lot of people mobilizing, but it doesn't mean that you really have uh, a choice of policies. You have a choice of not even a selection of elites, because the selection is previously done, so you just have to vote. Huh? So that's, I think, happening very often in the West as well. Uh, delegative democracy is more or less what you get out of that. Not only Latin America, just take Trump, he made a lot of promises, didn't he? He was going to change. He, is going, he doesn't do anything. He's, he's not exactly a nice guy. But you can't tell, say that Trump is doing something very different from what Democrats are doing in power. No, he's following his program exactly in the way he was saying. He does one or two things now with, uh, uh, with 
uh, not iron with uh, steel, the, 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 the getting into this mess with protection to American production of steel, but it's, this, these things are more symbolic than actually a change of policies. And you see, we saw that in, in France as well with Hollande, promised a lot of stuff, got elected, and did exactly the opposite. He took the new liberal policies of, of Sarkozy and Merkel and applied them, destroyed the socialist part, but still, he didn't follow his electoral problems. So you have this sort of delegative democracy as one of the elements of the closure of the political system because you don't really have a real mediation between voters, between social organizations, and the formal political system. You can have also uh, what Mahir, Katz and Mahir called uh, the development of state parties in the collusion between parties. And you look at them, they are totally dependent on the state. These are more of a European phenomenon, right? Uh, it has to do with public financing, but has to do also, which is something more widespread, a collusion between parties. There, a sort, there, there is a sort of a tacit agreement between them that programs will be very similar. You don't really have a choice, right? They, do, they all do the same thing. They all propose the same thing. The main example is perhaps Germany now. They always have this grand coalition, which means that for voters, doesn't matter what you do, you always get the same government. It's something really amazing with the same policies. Well, some variation here and there, but you just have this sort of collusion that sort of colonized completely the formal political system and you can do nothing about it. So you can't break into the political system with what voters or social organizations decide with their programs because the state is controlled by political forces that have no project of really mediating between society and state. But you can have also things that seem more neutral, but they are not neutral. Uh, even the bureaucracy can play this role, right? You look at the European Union. Uh, you can have elections everywhere you can vote, you can even have parties which have different programs and you elect them and what happens? The bureaucracy of the European Union rules each country its own way. So the programs don't matter either. So you, once again, you have a mechanism of closure of the political system, which is, uh, these things usually coalesce, they are not, they don't go by themselves usually, they are all somehow entangled and they reinforce each other. Uh, of course, you could speak also about the role of money, which has always been important uh, in liberal democracy, but has, especially in the case of the US, and in the case of at least some Latin American countries, even has, has become even more important. So you have this oligarchization also uh, with respect to the influence of plutocracy in the political system. However, I think here we have to be careful because I don't want to collapse political power into uh, economic power. In modernity, it doesn't work like that. That's one of the reasons why I think you have to be very careful when it gets uh, traditional political theories, traditional political concepts, uh, like oligarchy, like uh, democracy, you know, the, the way the Greeks spoke about it, or, and translate that directly to the modern world. Because if, if, if you think of oligarchy originally, economic power went together very closely with political power. There was not necessarily even an institutional distinction between these things. But now we live in a society that is highly differentiated. So the political system has a high level of, of autonomy and you don't turn economic power directly into political power. Of course, that you can have a lot of influence, you can buy people, you can lobby with them, you can finance their campaign and they, they afford, you have the more or less under your control, but there is no direct relation between economic and political power. Besides, it's not only uh, bourgeois, right-wing parties or whatever 
uh, that are oligarchical. If you look to the parties, supposedly on the left, they have become, I think, also even more oligarchical than they used to be. Because if you take left-wing parties, they used to be mass parties. They had an internal oligarchy, of course. They were controlled by either the Communist Party or German Social Democracy or Peronism or whatever. Well, Peronism is not a left-wing thing, but look at the Workers' Party in Brazil. They were controlled by a sort of oligarchy, but now this has become increasingly more devoid of popular participation. These are increasingly less uh, mass parties. They have become uh, electoral parties, although they control a lot of uh, organizations that are linked either formally or informally to them, especially unions and all sorts of associations related to social issues, NGOs or whatever. But the control of the machine is much more disconnected from participation within the party. So you take, for instance, communist parties with democratic centralism, which was an element, in a way or another, it's working. Most of these parties now are not concerned with that. Uh, and I think that if you look at Africa, for instance, South Africa, I, I would think, but you may correct me later, that works more or less like that as well. I doubt very much whether the ANC now has great mass participation or whether it has become really a professionalized machine and who calls the shots are really the guys who are controlling this machine. So you have a, a greater oligarchization of the system, both from mainstream parties and even left-wing opposition parties. This has given rise also, of course, to, to a lot of dissatisfaction. And this dissatisfaction is uh, coming up to this attempt of cre at creating new parties, uh, of challenging the political system. You see that in Spain with Podemos, you see that in Italy with these strange guys, nobody understands them very well. Uh, what's the name of the new party? But anyway, they are doing these things in Italy. You saw this already in Latin America. Chile was maybe the most clear example of a collusion between parties, right? They all had the same policy, there was a small variation. Nobody wants to do anything that's very different, that's going to threaten our democracy. And then you see this new party trying to break through the political system, exactly denouncing this oligarchization of the political system. This can happen, of course, also through more traditional parties. You see that in England, you see that in the US, right? Bernie Sanders tried to, to do this sort of move within the Democratic Party, but he didn't succeed. The political machine of the party, the internal oligarchy, managed to, to block his way. And you look at Britain, apparently Corbyn was more successful because he was able to mobilize the party, but it's doubtful whether, when in government, if he gets there, this will be very different. Because the way the political system is organized in Britain, the Westminster system, is extremely authoritarian. And I don't see how he would be able to keep a democratic outlook in terms of his social base, internal to the party, if he doesn't play the same game these people have been playing before. So, my thesis basically is that in making this move uh, without changing uh, the institutions, but making the process of mediation between the societal and the political system, uh, state political system less consistent, less responsive. And I think that's the main threat to democracy right now. This has a lot to do also with the reinforcement of executive power. That's why. Uh, the legative democracy or the role of bureaucracy in some countries is very important because bureaucracy is usually very much related also to, to executive power. We speak about Peru yesterday. Who really controls the, runs the country somehow is this technocracy that has been there for many years. So the president doesn't really matter so much who is there because they, well, they have been this pro new structure, this project now for some time and they, they do that. and. Doesn't matter very much what goes around that. You can have variations. You can have more social policy. You can have less social policy. But the, the core of, of the project is very much well established. Uh, 
The other which you could speak about, of course, in relation to the reinforcement of executive power, is populism. So you could think of that as a specific pathology of contemporary political life. Some people would even speak about populist regimes, uh, trying to differentiate between populist movements and populist regimes. I, I think that is mainly an exacerbation of this element uh, that you find in liberal democracies, the way they organize it, which is the many on the one side and how the political system actually works on the other side. Uh, having to do also with what I have been trying to work with, this relation between concreteness and abstractness, because the citizen in contemporary liberal democracies or advanced liberal oligarchies is supposed to, to deal with politics in a very abstract way. That was the desire of liberalism in particular, right? Parliamentary democracy was something to be dealt with in purely rational terms, without attachment to people. You didn't really represent specific things. You represented the nation in a very abstract way in parliament. And the discussion should be rational, sort of disregarding the specific demands of the electorate and, and the concreteness of, of the electorate. Some of them even wouldn't like to, to see many concrete issues seeping into the political system. But of course they did, and they do through sometimes uh, more decentered political movements, social movements and political parties that somehow bring these concrete issues into the system, but it's much easier to do that in a sense through this big, bigger than life sort of supposedly charismatic fit, uh, figures. That's not something that's uh, external to liberalism. This is internal to liberalism. It has to do with problems of representation, especially when representation becomes complicated, especially when mediation becomes complicated. The sort of big figure comes to the fore as if they were representing society. The first time it was clearly identified in modernity, was in Marx 18 Brumaire, right? You have a crisis of representation and then Bonaparte emerges. I'm not saying that populism and Bonapartism are the same, rather the opposite. I'm saying just that there is a phenomenon in liberal political regimes through which you have this big figure sort of incarnating what society supposedly wants and try to translate that as mediators into the political system. That's the core. The valid core, I think, of, of Laclau's theory, although the rest of it, I think, is entirely mistaken, uh, especially from the point of normative point of view, that, that would be the best way of, of doing politics from a popular point of view. But there is something to it in the sense that to translate the concrete into the abstract political system through a big figure. And you see this happen in the world today, I think, to a great extent, when it does because of this, which is really a crisis of representation. We speak about crisis of, we have been speaking about that for a long time, but it's a, actually it's a, a real thing because, and it's be, it, it tends to become worse in this, insofar as the political system, the state part of it, it has become more impervious from the photo uh, in relation to the demands that are rising on the societal side. Of course, also the media has a big role to play on that because oligarchy has to do with agenda setting, right? And, and the media has a, a key role in terms of agenda setting. And it has become an increasingly monopolized media. And you have a lot of collusion in the media as well. Different, even if they are different, right? They are, you don't have a monopoly, you have a lot of oligopolies but they, are ma they manage to sort of establish more or less the same agenda. And this influences, of course, the debate. And in this regard, if you think of liberal democracy as a situation in which you have a sort of public sphere, when you can debate things openly, where the teams come up from the societal side, of course, the monopolization, oligopolization of the media, agenda setting, Prime. There are a lot of terms that people use in communication theory to discuss how they do it. Uh, this has been very strict. It has become very strict. And it's closely related 
to the political dynamic that is established now between the societal and the state sides of the political system. Uh, with, with the development of democracy now, how do we think about the development of democracy now? Uh, it's, it's complicated. I think that uh, we can't think about a, an attempt at the re-democratization of liberal democracy, right? This is a possibility, right? Formally, theoretically, this is a possibility. Uh, if that's not the case, what, how do we get to a process of democratization? Again, I, I think it's not clear at all what that's supposed to be. You have a lot of movements trying to, to, to deal with that. Because the political system is so close, you have this sort of more autonomous perspective emerging in political life, right? From different quarters. Andreas likes to stress the poor. I think it's right to some extent, although I prefer to speak about ple plebeians in the sense that there is no direct translation of economic issues into political issues. And the poor are not necessarily mobilized as the poor and with an agenda that would take us in the direction of the oligarchization of the political system. We have seen this in Latin America. People have a lot of social policies. They pretend to represent the poor. The poor are not necessarily disorganized, but still this doesn't run counter to the oligarchization of the political system. It can go together with that to some extent at least. Right? I'm not saying that the poor are pro-oligarchical, but the way the political system is organized favors the oligarchization of the organizations that intend or pretend to represent the poor. So you have a problem in this regard as well. Then you have other democrat uh, attempts at democratization. The issues that come up are not only related to poverty or, or even to inequality. You have a lot of demands of democratization that have to do with human rights, that have to do with cultural rights, that have to do with civil rights in a very basic sense. And these are all uh, demands that have to do with democratization. What is not very clear, it's how we can transform the political system, even because it's not very clear that you can re-democratize liberal democracy. I'm not sure you can do that. Also because this has been going together with a strengthening of the state in relation to society, which is not the same as oligarchization, is not the same as the development of this advanced liberal regime, but is connected to it and helps its development, including elements of police uh, action, surveillance and all the sort of things that is also increasingly important in the contemporary world. We have uh, the state developing uh, a lot of power. It hasn't retreated uh, as neoliberal supposed demanded it is. Not only the economic realm, but in terms of its penetration into society, how it permeates society and how it's capable of fashion subjectivities, surveilling, and police in society, either in a more, uh, uh, in a nicer way, or in a more repressive way, or in a more violent way, it depends on the country, it depends on the political uh, situation, it depends on the hegemony of liberalism in each of these countries. And then you have this development of, on the one hand, of oligarchization, and it's connected somehow to this strengthening of state power which makes the, the, the state side, the societal side of the political system even uh, more sort of defenseless in relation to what's going at the, the state level. This has been connected to lots of developments as well because you have the enforcement of state power but you have also an automatization of societal agents. Uh, it would take us too far if, uh, to, to get into the sociology of that. But people are increasingly autonomous in social life, and they want to organize in, a, in, a, in an increasingly autonomous way. And I think that's why you have all this, also these movements 
related to autonomy, sometimes to anarchism, and a rejection of the political system, and an affirmation of subjectivity in terms of politics. That is a counter tendency to this strengthening of the state. So what witness now, to some extent, is a, it's like the, a mouth, an alligator mouth. It's a, opening up on the one side oligarchization and straight state strengthening, on the other the societal political system more distant from the formal state political system and at the same time an autonomy an autonomy autonomization of societal agents at the social level as such but also at the political level which implies a very complicated situation because it's, I would not say that we'll, we'll live in a permanent political crisis, but makes politics something very, very, very unstable. And how it combines with electronic media and this sort of thing tends to accelerate the tempo of politics, at least to some extent, and create a lot of problems insofar as this mediation doesn't properly happen. So. Um, I think this, uh, this is the basic dynamic of, of political systems we are living through today. This goes together with, however, the maintenance of a liberal infrastructure. That's why I'm speaking about liberal oligarchy and then liberal democracy and then advanced liberal oligarchy because the basic infrastructure of, of, of social life, let's say, which is rational law remains in place to a lesser or to a greater extent. This is the, the, the way the state organized itself and organized society since the beginning of modernity. So that's also one of the aspects of, 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 of this political system that we should keep in mind. Liberalism organized social life and hegemony and the possibility of, of using less repression or having a softer form of domination is also connected to, the, to how deep this sort of, of liberal inf legal infrastructure is inside society, convince people and organize social life. So countries where it's less well established tend to have a more important role for the police explicitly than others that don't. Yet, the police is extremely important everywhere. So it's, it's not a, acts of exception, as you see, this Patriot Act in the US, but it's, the police has become also, uh, I think, a, a more important element in the organization of political regimes than it was before, something that contributes to this development of advanced liberal legal. Well, I think that's more or less what I had to say. Uh, I hope it was clear enough. If not, we can debate it after my status time. Okay.